243. Uh, I think we need to do it without the music because I can't sing that high. <laughs> I'm a low singer, I'm sorry. <laughs> 243, Victory in Jesus. I'll try to get it in a key we can all sing in. Because we have victory in Jesus because of the raised Savior. The Lord who came back from the death, the only religious leader that's not buried somewhere. Um, so, and that's, that's, uh, that's what we can, that was what we can praise the Lord about. Number 243, if we could sing together. <clears throat> I heard an old, old story. Our Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary. To save a wretch like me, I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus. My Savior forever, he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me, I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory. Beneath the cleansing flood, the last verse, I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing up there the song of victory let's sing it out oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me, I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Now, we rarely get this chance, praise the Lord, but if you've got a favorite song that you'd like to, for us to sing, a congregational song, just shout it out. We'll do it. Waiting, 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 waiting. It is well with my soul. Let's see if we can get the words for everybody. I'm pretty sure that one's in here. It's 145, number 145, It Is Well With My Soul. We miss our guitar when we don't have it, don't we? It's a real blessing. I've been in churches over the years that don't have music, and it's, it's tough. But praise the Lord for our church. We've, we, are so, we have so many wonderful, talented musicians and and um, and ministers that can lead us along. Praise the Lord. Uh, 145, it is well with my soul. <clears throat> when peace like a river attendeth my soul, when horrors like sea billows roll, whatever my lot 
by television. God bless each of you. Uh, we here at Solid Rock Church are so thankful for you to be here on the Lord's Day. Amen? Amen. And um, just ask to lift in prayer. Many of those are going through a whole lot of um, situations and issues, health, finances, all kind of things. I uh, had some different family members that passed um, in the community here. I should lift them in their prayers. But we're glad you're here this morning. And if we could, we're going to go ahead and take our morning tithes and offerings because we've got a lot to do today. Amen? Amen. And the Lord says, I'm looking forward to what God has. So if you guys will come on forward, that'd be great. Why don't we all why don't we all sing this together while we are taking up the Lord's tithes and offerings this morning? Listen closely. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. 
I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. What you are about to hear this morning is the culmination of a lot of prayer. And we have invited someone that we are very, very proud of. I wish she lived here where she could be here all the time, uh, but uh, let's pray to that end. But we want this morning to welcome our church's attorney and a real fireball for the Lord Angela Fernulovich. Thank you, Pastor Dave. I love you. Father, give me your words to speak to your yes. beloved children. Yes. Stand me up, Father, or I will not stand up. We need you in this place, and I ask you to fill it and to fill your children with your love so greatly. Hold them so tight, Father, that they never want to be in the presence of anyone else. We love you, Father, and we thank you for your hand and your blessing. And when we see it move, we are going to shout, that is our Father. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. I'm bringing some good news to you guys today. It is a culmination of par prayer, like Pastor Dave said, over many years. And it is a prayer that has been answered in this church. And it was answered when Pastor Dave said 57 million children are dead and I could do nothing about it. It was answered when I cried and Nikki said, let me hold up your arms. We will hold your arms up while you pray. This prayer was answered when Mary Smith and Jeff provided for me when I did not know how I was going to put food on my table. It was answered when Mary Dockstetter came down to this church with me every Thursday morning to pray, and we used as an excuse that we would vacuum the floor, that sister held me up. This prayer was answered when someone who is not going to be named, but who knows who they are, when I had to recuse myself from their case. And I cried for hours because I could not go and get my brother out of jail because of my job. He knows who he is, I love you. This prayer was answered when I had nothing left and when Sister Brandy was going to have a baby and we celebrated that new life in the room right back there. And we praise God for it. And that prayer was answered when Shirley went all the way down past Myrtle Beach and came up to take me out to lunch because she loved me and she missed me. The love of God is in this place. Yes. And if you think that the enemy does not know it, you are wrong. That's right. He knows it. And he is going to be after you, and we have a very short time. But for today, we are going to thank God for what he has already given us. And what he has given us is actually the solution to the slaughter of 57 million babies. And it's not a case that you have heard about in the news because the enemy of your soul does not want you to pray for this case to bring it to fruit. But this is something that the Lord has given us and it is your job to pray for it 
until the fruit is born. For five years, I crafted the perfect case to end abortion. It had to do with an aborted child who sued through a next friend. That is the only way to take down this Roe v. Wade decision. Nowhere in the country could you get standing for an aborted child. It would not happen, but I prayed anyway. And I looked every day and I cried every day. I said, Lord, how can we do this? He sent me to law school and he gave me a law degree. I never wanted to be a lawyer. Never wanted to be a lawyer, period. I went to that law school and applied because my father told me to. And they took me in that law school before I had even graduated with my undergraduate degree. Half of the professors in that law school did not want me there. And every day when I walked that hallway, I was terrible to them in their eyes. And they said to me, Angela, you cannot walk into a courtroom preaching the word of God. You cannot walk into every place like you own it. But I've got news for you, Liberty University School of Law. I do own everything. It belongs to my father and to their father. I took the yoke of Liberty University School of Law onto me because I love that house that my father built. I love Jerry Falwell, but he was a servant. He did not build that law school. Our Father God built that law school. And let me tell you, anywhere our footsteps, it belongs to us. We have, a, we have an inheritance in Christ Jesus. He has given it all to us. He gave us dominion over this earth, and this earth belongs to his children. And if you don't like that, I'm sorry. If you want to take my degree away from me, do it. But I am done with your Pharisee spirit. It is not natural law theology that is going to take down the demon that is killing our children. Let me tell you guys about this case before I get going any further. There's a case in Alabama, it's called the Baby Row Case, and I have written about it. Um, I actually tried to print off some information for you guys to have, and the Lord wouldn't let me print it. So I'll have to send it to you in email if he will let me. Um, this case is not my case in a courtroom. It's a case in prayer. He has given us a better part. He has answered our prayer. He chose someone who could go into a courtroom without speaking his word, and I praise him for it. I had no idea that there was anyone else in the world who was praying for this case, but there was, thank God. And this case is the very first time that an unborn aborted child has had standing to sue on his or her own behalf. The case is called the Baby Row case, okay? This case is so powerful that it has trapped the abortion industry. That is the reason that you're not hearing anything about this case. No matter what the abortion industry does, it is going to lose because this case will get in front of the Supreme Court for a decision on the personhood of an unborn child. Personhood is important, and let me tell you why it's important. The reason that Roe v. Wade was decided was because they disregarded the personhood of the child. If someone is not a legal person, they have no due process rights under the U.S. Constitution. This is the reason we had the stain of slavery on our country, because our brothers and sisters were considered less than human, the same way that this court 
in its shamefulness has considered an unborn child to be less than human, but not anymore. This case was filed on February the 9th of this year, and it was filed for the first time because the citizens of Alabama, likely our brothers and sisters who we do not even know, voted for a constitutional amendment to declare that unborn children are persons just like any other person. And so there are two lawyers who have gone and they have gone ahead, these bold lions charging the darkness, and they have sued. They have sued the abortion clinic who caused this child's death, and they have sued the pharmaceutical company that made and manufactured the drug that induced the death of the child. Doesn't matter what they've sued for. If they go all the way up and they win, which would be beautiful, it's still gonna go to the Supreme Court. And let me tell you why. The abortion industry has no choice but to assert the mother's right to abortion as third parties or they have no defense. If they have no defense in this case, everybody is going to sue the abortion industry and they are going to be utterly bankrupt. Utterly bankrupt, that's what's gonna happen. But it's better than that. It's better than that. It's better than that. Because they filed an answer to this complaint. And their answer was, what they have done is lawful. They asserted the woman's right to abortion. And because they have, you, you can be sure. Doesn't matter if this case is dismissed. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if Baby Roe loses on summary judgment. Doesn't matter if it goes all the way up and they win. It is, like, it is like a tree with many branches, all to victory at the Supreme Court for the personhood of this child. Yeah. Doesn't matter what happens. Mm -hmm. If this case is dismissed, you must pray for it yeah. because the victory will be won at the top yeah. when the Supreme Court is confronted with the slaughter of 57 million babies mm -hmm. and they have no choice but look at what they have done to our country and to our heritage of our children. Yes. And if, any, if anybody has any questions, I am more than happy to stay after the service and we can talk about it then. But even though I'm rejoicing in this case, this case is really not what I came to talk to you about today. Although it is beautiful, and it is what God has given to us, not to me. He's given it to all of us yeah. because of the love in this place. Mm -hmm. let, let me ask you right now, anybody in here, do you think I'm a liar? If you do, I want you to stand up right now and state your case. Come on, anybody? Let me tell you that the scripture says there is going to come a day when the Lord is going to pour out his spirit on his sons and his daughters. The young men are going to have visions. The old men are going to have dreams. In the last days. And let me tell you that is happening now. I have seen it with my own eyes. The Lord has placed me with a group and they have seen it. The hand of the Lord is moving so quickly that I cannot even comprehend it. My brain is not big enough to take it in. And when this, when this case first came in the news and I saw it and started thanking God for it, the Lord said to me, for just an instant, when I thought, 
what, you know, what am, what am I going to do? What am I going to do here? How can, I, how can I help this case? I'll do anything for it. I'll go and I'll shovel cow manure if I have to, to get this case to the Supreme Court. And the Lord said to me, I have sent you to reap what you haven't sown, Angela. Amen. What does this mean, Father? And then he opened so many things to me. And the night before I called Pastor Dave to, to tell him about this case and to ask him to let me come and tell you about it, and he so graciously said yes. Thank you, Pastor Dave, for trusting me enough with your pulpit. The Lord gave me a dream. And before the dream was finished, he had an angel wake me up. And in the dream, there was a, a gigantic ship that was coming into the harbor. And I ran down to meet the ship because I knew I needed to get on it. And I went to the wrong dock. And I'm standing at the wrong dock. The ship went in somewhere else, way down the road, at the end of the road. I have no idea how I knew it was the end of the road, but it was the end of the road. And as the ship pulled in, A giant face came to me and said, the storm is coming. You have 10 minutes to get here. You have to be here in 10 minutes. So I did what I do best, which is run. I ran and um, praise God. <laughs> I didn't go to the ship, I went home. I went home, I went into a room where there were lots of people who were my family. And I knew that they were my family, although I didn't recognize them and I said, Get this, the train is coming, it's at the end of the road, you must get me to the train. They had no idea what I was talking about because I was calling it a train and it was really a ship. They wouldn't take me. So I kept going. And then in the next room was my mother. And I said, get in your car quickly, take me to the end of the road, I must get on this train. Still calling it the wrong thing. She had no idea what I was talking about, and she was taking me nowhere. So I ran out into the street, and I thought, how am I going to get to the end of the road when I only have 10 minutes? And I realized that my pockets were full. And in one pocket, I can't tell you how I knew this, but there were $20. There were two $20 bills, $40. And I knew that I needed this for my trip. And then I thought, how am I going to get somebody to take me to the end of the road? And so I put my hand deep into my other pocket, and there was something that felt like a piece of lint. I said, what is this, Lord? And I pulled it out, and it was a $12 bill. Did not seem unusual to me at all. <laughs> I thought, this is very precious. I cannot give this to anyone to take me to the end of the road. How in the world would they make change for a $12 bill? Because, of course, I'm not giving it all up. And at that time, something poked me as I was in panic, wondering how I was going to get to this. And I actually had a roller bag behind me. And when I looked at it, I said, what do I need this luggage for? Boom, and I threw it away. Um, an angel of the Lord woke me up, poked me twice in my back to wake me up. What does it mean, people? It means we've got 10 minutes. Yes. And thank you, Father, for 10 minutes. Thank you that you have given us 10 minutes. Some of you know that before I ever became a Christian, when I was married, I was married to a fisherman. And in the summertime, we would go out on the boat, and we had deckhands, as we had a charter for a seafood company, and every year before we would set off out in the ocean in one of the most dangerous places in the world, we would teach anyone who was new on the boat how to survive. We would take out the survival suits. Uh, we would show them, show them how to work the emergency beacons, how to undo the raft in preparation for our trip. In one year, when I did not particularly trust my husband very much, shame on me, as we were doing, um, as we were doing the safety training, I sat in front of him and, and, and the other new deckhands, we had two new deckhands that year, I think, 
I said, look, if anything happens to this boat and I go overboard and my children go overboard because my children were on the boat too, the two oldest boys, do not go after me. You go after my children. And if you do not go after my children and you pull me out of the water and my feet hit this deck, it is not going to be good for you. <laughs> Trust me. That was directed at my husband. The deckhands did not know that. So one of the deckhand pipes up and he says, Angela, you do not have to worry about me going in after you or your children. I will never go in after anyone. I'm going to stay on the boat. That is the wrong thing to say to me. <laughs> when you're on a boat, it takes everybody. Everybody has to work as a whole, and you have to have respect for the water. You must. I told my husband to get rid of him, and he did not do it. But we did eventually. About halfway through the trip, he put every one of our lives in danger because he did not respect where he was or the life that he had in his hands when he ran that boat in the middle of the night. We bought him a plane ticket and we put him on the plane as soon as we hit the dock and got rid of him. And so why am I telling you this, people? I'm telling you this because we have 10 minutes to get on the boat and this boat is the body of Christ. We've got 10 minutes, no more. And let me tell you, if you are not willing to jump in the water to go get God's children, because God is the captain of this boat. If you are not willing to jump in at peril of your own life to get his children, you are not fit to be on this boat. I don't want you there. You will put everybody else in danger. All of us. but it's okay. We have a survival suit. The Lord has given us one. Not only has he given us dominion over all of the world, he has given us power. He has given us power over all the power of the enemy so that nothing will hurt you. The survival suit that the Lord has given us is the belt of truth wrapped around your waist. What is truth? Truth is this book, the word of God. He has given you the breastplate of righteousness because you cannot be righteous on your own. He gives it to you. It is a gift, the righteousness of God he's given to you. When you call his name, when you give your life to him, he gives you that breastplate. You don't have to pay for it. He paid the price on the cross. He has given you feet that are shod to preach the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation for these children that are outside of the boat. He has given you the shield of faith. He has already given you, just like I, my pockets were full, he has given each of you every single thing you need. There is nothing that you need that he has not given to you. He has given you a helmet of salvation to guard your mind against the enemy. You do not have to doubt that you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. He has given you a weapon which is the sword of the spirit and this book which is the word of God Amen. and so how do you get fit for this because the war is coming and it is coming here and you better believe it if you will know them by their love 
you can believe that this place is known. The enemy knows it. And if you think he doesn't have his sights on you, and if you think that you are not going to wake up with a demon on your chest like I did all the time in law school, you are wrong. Most of these churches and most of these theology schools teach doctrines of demons. Let me tell you how much I love Liberty University and they taught me the word of God and for that I am forever thankful. But they did not teach me that the world and everything in it belonged to God and he had given it to me that I had the authority to bind Satan and drive him to his knees to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I sat in those classrooms knowing better Elmer Towns, if you are alive, get your face in the dirt and repent. I sat in your New Testament class, and you had us read a fictional account of the New Testament. Do you not know that you are not to add or take away from the word of the Lord? And then you told us, then you told us that no one hears from God anymore. That is a lie from the pits of hell, and if you have not heard from God, you are not one of his. You better consider yourself, whether you be in the faith, because I do not believe that you are. And I had already heard from God for two years before I listened to this. And then you sent me to the law school. And I took on that yoke for 10 years. And every single fact pattern that I brought to you and said, this will work, this will work. They said, Angela, bad facts, bad law, bad facts, bad law. And your knees shook. You have graduated 12 classes from that law school. Why do we still have abortion in this country? It is because you are eaten with fear and pride. I spit on your case law. You come to me and I will show you how to argue your case in front of a mighty God with a blindfold on. Your reason will get you nowhere if you do not know the Holy Scriptures. There is a law greater than man's law. And I praise God that I broke away from you. This book is not persuasive. It is not public policy. It is higher than your case law and statutes. And you will never win your case without the word of God in prayer. And Philip Klein, let me tell you, I learned nothing from you. Do you think I learned trial advocacy from you? No. And let me ask you, why do you think you lost your law license when you went after Planned Parenthood? It was because you did it for political purposes. You didn't do it for the Lord. You are a stench in his nostril. Then you have the nerve to call me a mad black woman when I tell you to get on your knees and pray. I am a black woman. We are all one color. How dare you say that to a child of the living God? Jerry Jr., how I have praised God for your independent spirit. For two years, 
I love the independents, but you have not done your job. You better clean out that law school and get rid of that natural law theology, and you better get rid of the doctrines and demons at that law school. The gifts of the Lord have not ended. In fact, they have only just begun. Jesus Christ said, greater works will you do because I go to the Father. Amen. Repent, Jerry. You better go in there with a whip and get yourself cleaned up and clean out that school. You can't even share good news at that school anymore. It is a shame and a stench to our holy God. to tell you something, guys, that the Lord has shown me. Forgive me for picking up my mess. When I was in law school and I was walking through a nest of pit vipers every day, the only thing that kept me sane was praying the Psalms. I prayed them all the time because I wasn't taught in undergraduate in the law school, although they showed me the word of God and I did learn it. How to fight against the enemy of our soul when we have an enemy. And our enemy is not other people. Our enemy are those principalities and powers of darkness and rulers in high places. I wasn't taught how to deal with that. But the Lord took me to the Psalms over and over and over. And I'm going to read Psalm 18 to you, and then I'm going to tell you how you need to get fit to get on this boat, because we've got 10 minutes. I'm going to read from Psalm 18, and I want you to understand, no matter what anybody tells you, this is not a pretty song. It is a testimony of a man who was after God's own heart. And then I'm going to tell you what it means. Stand up for the reading of the Lord. Psalm 18. I love you, God. You make me strong. Thank you. God is the bedrock under my feet and the castle in which I live my rescuing night. Thank you, Father. My God, the high crag where I run for dear life, hiding behind the boulders and safe in the granite hideout. I sing to God the praise lofty, and I find myself safe and saved. It's a testimony, people. It's not a pretty song. It's David's testimony. The hangman's noose was tight at my throat, and the devil waters rushed over me. Hell's ropes cinched me tight. Death traps barred every exit. It was a hostile world, and I called to God, and I cried to God to help me. From his palace, he hears my call. My cry brings me right into his presence, a private audience. Yeah. Amen, Father. Yeah. Amen, Father. Yeah. You need to understand that, that your cry brings you into the presence of the Lord. Just because you cannot see it doesn't mean it's not true. Yes. And when I cried to the Lord, the earth wobbled and it lurched and huge mountains shook like leaves and they quaked like aspen leaves because of his rage. He does not like it when his children are being attacked. His nostrils flare bellowing smoke and his mouth spits fire. Tongues of fire dart in and out and he lowers the sky. He steps down under his feet and an abyss opens up and he's riding a winged creature, swift on wind wings. He wraps himself in a trench cloak. 
trench coat of black cloud darkness, but his cloud brightness burst through, spraying hailstones and fireballs. Then God thundered out of heaven. The high God gave a great shout. He sprayed hailstones and fireballs. God shoots his arrows in pandemonium. He hurls his lightning a rout. The secret sources of the ocean are exposed and the hidden depths of the earth lie uncovered. The moment that he roars in protest and lets loose his hurricane anger. You ready for the good part? But he caught. What does David say? Put everything out for him. The good, the bad, everything good he has given you, everything that you have done wrong, you lay it out in front of him and let him put the pieces back together. David said, when I got my act together, God gave me a fresh start. He said, now I'm alert to God's ways and I take nothing for granted. Every day I review the way that God works. Look for his hand. It's there. I try not to miss a trick is what David said. Lord, don't let me, don't let me miss seeing your hand. Every day I review the way that God works and try not to miss a trick and I feel put back together and I'm watching my step. God rewrote the text of my life when I opened the book of my eyes to his heart. Do not think that he doesn't know what's in your heart, people. And let me tell you, I need a pen. Let me tell you, he knows everything that's in your heart. Okay, and that's another one of these doctrines of demons, that once you are saved, you do not have to repent. Well, if you want to go about your life that way, do it. But you will never see the hand of, the God, move, of God move, and you will never move on his fullness and his power and his authority until you learn to repent. And let me tell you what I did, because I make lists, and I look for evidence everywhere I go. This is one of my lists of every single sin that I could call to mind. And I sit down with these lists and I examine myself. Have I committed this sin in the natural world? If so, forgive me, Father. Have I committed this sin in my heart and my mind? If so, forgive me, Father. And I will tell you what I found out, even me, is that I am one of the most sinful people that has ever walked the face of this earth. But I have nothing to fear in front of a holy God when I lay it down and say, I'm sorry, Father. Keep me from this sin. Do not let me commit this sin again. You do it too. And if you're, if you're going to get fit for this boat, and if you're going to live your real life where he said, I have given you life more abundantly, then you are going to have to give everything back to him. And I can tell you how to do it today. If you want to know, you stand up in your spirit, man. I've still got you standing. Thank you. I haven't even finished reading the word of God. You give the Lord your heart and you say, take it and do anything that you want to with it and open it up and search it and take anything out of it that does not bring you glory. And then if you find that you have taken it back from him, you do the same thing. You give it back to him and you say, I'm sorry, Father, I have stolen from you and taken something that does not belong to me anymore. If you have to do that 10 times a day, you do it until you stop taking it back from our Father. And then when you find out that you can't even think, you give him your brain and you say, Father, here it is. Rework it. Rewire it. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Your ways are higher than my ways. Give me your thoughts, Father, and teach me your ways. 
you repent of your sin. All of it. You say, Father, cleanse me and I will be clean. Heal me and I will be healed. Nobody loves you more than Jesus Christ. You don't need to be whoring around under every green tree looking for somebody to love you. He has loved you enough to die for you. He came for you when you were most unwanted. Get down here right now and repent and give your, your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody who wants to get on this boat now. This is your invitation. If anybody has a need, if you need to do business with the Lord, prayer warriors, would y'all come, please? We don't have anything fancy to offer you except repentance this morning. And if that is something you need to do and you need someone to pray with you, you grab one of these folks by the hand and ask them to pray with you. Father, I ask you right yeah. now to be in this place, Father. I ask you to press these hearts and fill it with your Holy Spirit, Father. Let us not be empty vessels. Fill us with you. You have promised us. You have said in your word that you give good gifts to your children. How much more so will you not give the Holy Spirit to those who ask for it, Father? That's right. We ask for it now, Father. Father, there is no one like you. Amen. Father, thank you for forgiving us and making us whole in your son. Thank you for loving us when we were unlovable. Thank you for being the friend of a sinner. We thank you for your word, Father. Amen. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, Father. We thank you that there's nothing we cannot bring before you that you will not heal and save. I ask you, Father, that your word be spoken in this earth, in this country, in this city, in this town. I ask you that your word be spoken in the restaurants, in the classrooms. I ask you that your word be spoken in the bar rooms, in the brothels, Father. Come and get your children. Send workers out into the harvest for these children. And praise God, do not go in after me. The Lord will come and get me. He will come and get you too. He will pluck you up. He has done it to me before, and I have seen it, people. You do not want to miss this boat that we've got 10 minutes to get on, because if you do, there is not going to be a rerun. That's right. It is not coming back for you. <laughs> You are not safe unless you are on that boat. And if a demon in hell comes after you, you bind him and drive him to his knees to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is what has been given to you. Take it! The good people taste your goodness, Father. The whole people taste your health. The true people taste your truth, and the bad ones can't figure you out, Lord. You take the sod of the down and out. Father, you rescue the poor and you heal the brokenhearted. But the stuck up, you take down a peg. Have we all not been that way, Lord? But 
when David gave everything to God, suddenly God floodlighted his life and he was a blazing glory, God's glory. David was able to smash the bands of the marauders. He vaulted the highest fences. What a God. God's road stretches straight and smooth and every God direction is road tested. David says, everyone who runs to God finds him. Is there any God like our God? Are we not at bedrock or solid rock with our God? This is the God who arms us and aims us in the right direction so that we can run like a deer, so that we will be king of the mountain. He shows us how to fight. He lets us bend a bow of bronze. He protects us with his salvation armor. He holds us up with a firm hand. And at the same time, he caresses us with his gentle ways. He clears the ground under us so that our foot is on a firm setting. We can chase our enemies and when we catch them, we do not have to let them go. He arms us well for this fight. He makes our enemies turn tail and run. With him, we will wipe out the haters. Psalm 18, people, read it. You're going to find out at the end that those blessings are for David and all of his descendants. We are all descendants of David. You are mighty warriors, beloved of God. Amen. He has said you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. That's right. Jesus Christ was made manifest to destroy the works of the enemy. And he gave you authority and power over all the power of the enemy. Every step you take should make hell Fear and quake and tremble. Yeah, that's right. He has called you a valiant warrior. Not an illegitimate child. Father, I thank you that you've given us ten minutes. I thank you for these people that I love dearly. Father, I ask that you move in them in a mighty way and that you wrap your arms around them and hold them so tight that they do not want to be in the presence of anyone but you. Father, I ask that you send laborers out into the harvest, that you press these people to go and get your children. Go get those children. Jump out of the boat, for God's sakes. He will come and get you. Stand us up in a wide open field, Father. We will take it. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for giving us your kingdom. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, that when you, we are in you, we have no reason to fear. You have not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and of sound mind. Search us, Father, if we have not given everything to you. Press us down until we do. And then give these children their abundant life that you promised.
there is no one like you, Father. Press these people to pray for this case that you have given us. And we do not even know if it will reach the Supreme Court before you come back. But when you come back, Father, find us working yes, in your field right. and in your vineyard. We give you praise this day, Father. And I thank you. Y'all may be seated. Okay, and now Pastor Dave can preach. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be kidding. <laughs> With the candidates for baptism and all that, if you would be getting ready at this moment, Lee is going to be baptizing here in just a moment or two. Uh, I guess you can all come down on these front rows, and we will call you up as we are getting ready. Uh, Lenny, would you put another DVD in for this? Uh, the reason I was standing at the back back there with Lenny is the devil was trying to shut that DVD player.